Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Hey, Tony, there's something that every solo entrepreneur needs to hear. If you're running your own show, you know how important branding and client management are. And speaking of making things easier for solopreneurs, let's talk about Schedulicity. It's designed to personalize your client interactions from start to finish. Schedulicity has some cool new features coming. You'll soon be able to customize your booking page, add your own logos, choose your colors, and really make it sing to your brand's personality. It's like giving your business a digital front door that looks and feels like you. Schedulicity isn't just about looking good. Schedulicity is designed to make everything smoother from booking to billing. You know, it's not just about the looks. It's about efficiency, too. They've integrated something pretty slick, intake forms. Now clients can fill out all the details before they even step foot into the door. What's cool is these forms attach to the client's profile and update automatically for future appointments. Talk about saving time and starting on schedule. It's your schedule and your success all rolled into one. With all these tools from Schedulicity, you're not just running your business, you're growing it. And for all the solopreneurs and suite owners out there, this is exactly the kind of support we need to stand out in a crowded market. Welcome to your day off. My name is Courtney. Of course, I'm sitting with my best friend, Tony. What's up, buddy? What's happening, brother? First, big shout outs to ABS for once again bringing us out to Chicago and letting us take over one of their rooms to uh, to do the podcast. So, you know, thank you to uh, Kate Gallagher and Frank Volko for uh, for bringing us out and really the whole ABS team. Yeah, I love those guys. And, it, and, and it's funny because when we stop the podcast and waiting for the next podcast to start, uh, they make comments how the room just goes so silent, right? <laughs> when we're so, not in here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it's you. So, <laughs> <laughs> but no, th- just the energy that this the podcast and everybody just brings to this room and just into just ABS, I, you know, is one of my favorites. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I, I, I love the show circuit. I love ABS. I love I love being here. Um, I love the energy that it brings, you know, like like I know like it, the, the shows can be daunting, but I also can't imagine life without them. Yeah. Kind of like know. with uh, Schedulicity. <laughs> Schedulicity, yeah. No, you <laughs> stupid. Um, uh, we, a big thank you to Schedulicity. They're sponsoring our weekend. Um, you know, as if you've been listening to the podcast for more than a, a few years, you know that we have this great relationship with Schedulicity. They uh, they always show up for the hairdressers, and, you know, um, they, they – they funnel everything through what's helpful to the hairdressers or not just the, but the whole beauty professionals, but you know, they, they filter through that and how they can make our lives easier. And that's their entire funnel and business plan. And from the top down, they're all that way. They all have that just putting us first, you know what I mean? Have us in mind, really mm-hmm. want to kind of help us succeed. And, and, and again, you know, we've said it a million times. They put us first. They do. And you know, um, Whenever you have the opportunity to spend money on a scheduling app, definitely consider Schedulicity because, again, they are they're there for you. I promise you. Yeah, ask anybody who even had to had to, to call the rock stars, the kind of experience, and they're there. They answer. They they want to fix any issues that you might have if you have any. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, th- they're incredible. I I I. I Probably sadly, I judge every uh, customer service experience uh, that I have to call, whether it's Comcast or whatever, to the rock stars over there at Schedulicity, and, and, and they all pair. You know, it's kind of like if you can't, if you're a company and you're not investing in your in your customer service reps, like what are you investing in? Yeah. I mean, they're the they're the they're the they're their line to uh, to the customer. You know, yeah, so they, they make you feel whether you want to continue to be a customer or not. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so once again, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Missy. And thank you, Schedulicity, for sponsoring this wonderful weekend here at ABS. So uh, this is really cool. When um, when we do live podcasts, we uh, we get to jump on air with, with people that um, that w- we see at the shows and uh, gives us the opportunity to chat them up. This is our second attempt at this. We uh, we tried to do a podcast last year, but that didn't that didn't see its way through. Um, but uh, but I'm glad today that we get to finally uh, finally chat with our with our with our friend Jack Howard. So interesting thing about Jack is like we actually live in the same city, but well, we live the 
We live there. I don't know. Jack kind of lives out of a suitcase someplace. He was just <laughs> going over his schedule, and it's absolutely absurd. Um, the next time he'll be in D.C., I think it's going to be in August sometime, and he, he, he allegedly li- he pays taxes there. We'll say that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So that laugh that you hear, that's Mr. Jack Howard. Jack, man, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm pleased to be here, and I do pay my taxes. Thank you very much. In, in D.C., right? In D.C., yeah. Yeah, you're never there, but you pay your taxes in D.C. I'm a resident there, so, yeah. That's crazy, yeah. man. I mean, again, listening in, he, he's just traveling everywhere. That's that, Has this been your entire career, or is this just something that's kind of like, like – I know they, it's part of your career, but now it seems like it's really intense. I think it's definitely part of my career, and it's very much part of my story in the last decade or so that there's so much travel. Um, but, you know, I mean, I started off like everybody, I, you know, I, in England, 16, uh, shampooing hair, you know, being a, sort of that boy that sort of picked up pin curls and, you know, rollers or had rollers thrown across the floor because he wasn't focused and things <laughs> like that, you know. But, yeah, it's great. I love the industry because... For me, there are so many different facets to it that I didn't know when I was 16 and 17 and 18. And I've been able to do so many different things and it's kept it so interesting for me. So, yeah, it's good. It's a good industry. So, so you found the industry around 16? Yeah, at 16 I started full time. I had a, you know, I've been hairdressing 42 years, so it's a long time. And when I was a teenager, so Saturday money, we used to call it in England. And so I had a part time job on a Saturday shampooing. Um, in a hairdresser's because I didn't re- want to work in a grocery store and I didn't want to deliver newspapers and I thought it would be glamorous and it certainly wasn't <laughs> but it was a lot of fun there were some interesting characters and I liked it and it, it felt at ease for me it was good that's amazing so like it, it's interesting that like uh, you know like you said 42 years into it but it wasn't something that you went into as a passion it was just kind of like I need I need a couple extra bucks well then yes mm-hmm. a couple of extra bucks and then when I was 16 I uh, I left home at 16, um, and it was a difficult period for me, and what would I do at 16? So I wasn't going to go to university, I didn't want to work in a shop, I couldn't work in an office, I would have killed me, and I thought, well, there's something that I know where there are people that I feel comfortable with, mm-hmm. and I was clever enough to think about long-term goals rather than short-term goals, because it certainly didn't pay very well right. to be an assistant, but look at, I'm sat in Chicago, you know, and I grew up in a small town in England, and I've traveled the world with this career. It's fantastic when, as I look back on my story. That's incredible. When did, when did you, like, when did you know, no? Like, like, when you started doing hair and, like, you knew that this would be your career path? That's a really good question because sometimes I sit and I still don't know. And, um, but I think when I, when I first started full-time hairdressing, I was just trying to run away from life. And I sort of buried myself in that. And then I went to London pretty quickly after that. And I, I probably spent more time dancing on bar tops than I did <laughs> really focusing on hair. I mean, I was like 19 in a great big city. It was like a boy in a candy store. It was when I first came to America in 93 that very much, very much an American story. I'm internally grateful to America for it because American hairdressers showed me the commerciality of hairdressing and how you could actually make really good money by turning up and doing solid work. Um, and I had never experienced that. It was all very much the artistry in England, and it was like you, the craft, and you know you earned nothing, and it was it was difficult. And suddenly in America, the paychecks were, I mean, they wanted you to work, but the paychecks were just like wow. And then you could see what you could do with life. That suddenly life was bigger, you know. And I've always loved an American hustle, the idea that you can have nothing and become something. Whether or not that's true, mm-hmm. it certainly was true for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been brilliant. How, do you think that there's a, um, you're talking about the artistry and the craft of hairdressing in England. Do you think that that's like a Sassoon hangover? That I think it, it was. And I think very much so, right? It was, you know. Certainly um, in 93. Yeah. Yeah. And pre that, mm-hmm. most definitely, it was. Uh, very much the creative side of it was what was seen in Hedges' journal and things like that. But then there was no representation that I could see of people that worked behind a chair. And when I, when I came to the States, very much behind the chair type hairdressers were big commodities and successful and were looked at differently to how you were looked at as just a hairdresser in the UK. I took that back to the UK with me. 
in like 2009 and everyone was like, oh, you're so American. And I'm like, there is nothing wrong with being an American. There is nothing wrong with looking at it like opportunity about this day, you can make so much money about the hustle, the drive. And of course it's changed. There are so many freelancers there now that realize that actually you can make, you can make money, but you can't work for these tight ass companies that don't pay you anything, so. When you came to the States, was it the DC area originally? Yes, I got offered this job in DC and the British guys owned the salon. And in those days, I was a color technician, wasn't necessarily a big thing. Color wasn't the hugest thing, it was cutting. And so there was a, a niche for it. And- um, Who'd you work for in DC? So a company called Elo, where oh, yeah, I think yeah, you know yeah, Sean, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Terry and Gary, uh, they, that place was, I'd never seen a salon so busy. I nearly died. Uh, because I was very British, and I, I mean, if you could see me now, guys, I'd be like, you know, I do foils, and you know, they're all perfectly folded and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And suddenly it was like, you, you know, back to back, one every 40, a full head in 45 minutes, a half head in half an hour, a tint in 20 minutes. I was like, what? You know? <laughs> and people showed me. People were really kind and showed me how to do it, because if you don't know what you don't know. Fair. And um, I was taught how to do it, and I was shown what you could earn from that, produce great work, and earn good money it was an amazing combination. There was a time where Elo was all British hairdressers. There were a lot and there. And that's where Claire and Helen yeah. and them worked, right? Yep. Well, they, they'd all come from Graham Webb, right? So yeah, yeah, that's Graham, where we, we went yeah. to Graham Webb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's sort of an interesting yeah. kind of connection, right? Right. Um, but yes, yeah, it was certainly eye-opening to me. American hairdressing was like, I was like, wow. I mean, really, for somebody that thought he was a London lad, Mm -hmm. I really wasn't very worldly at all. And it just showed me the possibilities. And, you know, but you have to make it happen. Well, that's it. I mean, we, we talked earlier on the podcast about how, like, you know, the hustle culture is 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 demonized almost now. But, you know, I, I believe that those that hustle, all those people that are, are, are scared to hustle or think that it's bad to hustle, I, 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 I'm fearful for them that they're going to get left in the dust at some point. Because mm -hmm. I think the hustlers are, are always going to float. Because, because... I'm a firm believer that in order to find purpose or in order to find yourself, you've got to do a lot of things. Like, these things don't come and seek you. Purpose doesn't come and seek you. Purpose doesn't come and find you. You've got to do a lot of things and go, that's my calling. I think you also, if you listen to somebody like Mel Robbins who talks about, you know, nobody's going to come get you. Nobody's going to come save you. Nobody's going to pay your bills for you. You've got to do it. But I think that what we forget or what the industry might have not, not talked about anymore is short-term versus long-term goals. So you, you work a trade show, you don't necessarily get paid for it, but you get to meet loads of people or you get to be showcased to lots of people because you're working it and people see you. And there's opportunity in that. It's, um, you might do something for a product company when you're starting out and they don't pay, but they provide the video and, the co and they help you build the content. And you know, there's connections and our industry is about connection uh, with clients and with coworkers too. So I think that I have been able to collaborate um, and long-term payoff has been better than short-term payoff. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm privileged in a sense that by the time I started doing that kind of thing, I had some money in the bank and I could do it. Um, but I did stuff on my day, days off, but I don't have children, you know, so I can do things on my day off. I'm a gay man, I, you know, I don't have those type of responsibilities that a lot of women in our industry have. Mm -hmm. And so it's different, but I do think that there are still short-term, long-term hustle. I've seen many, many successful women in this country who are earning six figures, who have got a couple of kids and a husband, and they're the main breadwinner. They hustle, and they work really, really hard, but they, they understand the system properly. I mean, there's no doubt. We, we, we've had a thousand of those women on the podcast. I love them. Know, I'm, you know, like, I'm amazed when I'm around those women. I'm just like, oh my goodness, just give me some of your energy. They're just fantastic. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, it. Again, talk about privilege. We've had the privilege of, of chatting with many people. Mm. You know, um, many women that are just absolutely killing it. You know, um, and and it's really cool now, especially if you see. I, I'll use Ashley Norman a, as the example because yes. I just she's such a boss. Like when she she's as diva as they come, and then she's as mom as they come. But she owns both spaces equal. And you should be able to. This is my point. I wouldn't see her, Ashley. I I met Ashley. I chat with Ashley. I don't see her as diva. I just see her as successful. I like just mean the way that she like you know when she did, when she does this, her her walks and stuff on the videos and stuff. I'm like <laughs> that girl's killing it. She you know what I mean? Yeah. She owns it. She, she owns, owns it. her space, no matter what yeah. that space is. You know. And she's thankful and she's humble and she's not. It's, 
which is amazing. Sweet as they come. Yes. And as sweet as they come, you yes. know. And, you know, she'll show up without makeup with a, with a kid on her hip, you know, and she owns that space just as much as she did, like, mm -hmm. prancing around for a video, you know. I, I We just adore her. She's great. I love fearless women, being around fearless women that want, that are going to say that, that I am enough for this mm. and I'm enough for that. And I just think it's such a... A brilliant thing to be able to say that and to be that and to live that. It's fascinating to be around. So when you were in Elo, yes. when did uh, did you realize that you wanted something like a little bit more with bright lights or, you know, the traveling, the the, the, ah. the, the stage, the... So I never thought that was I was going to be that kind of hairdresser. I never thought I was good enough to be that kind of hairdresser. I didn't... I always felt a bit sort of... Outs I felt a bit uncomfortable with myself and um i remember it was about 1990 something and one of the guys said to me you need to do this thing and it's like it, they're doing it in new york and it's a bit of bleach and i'm like what's that i foil and he's like no no it's called ballet ballet you know whatever <laughs> anyway i went on this course this balayage course with nancy braun and um and then i did it again because i made such a mess of it and i did it again and made such a mess of it but eventually i was able to turn my clientele mostly into balayage clients and then I was asked to do stuff with L'Oreal. They, they grandfathered me in and I started doing stuff and I loved it. I loved a classroom and a connection. I didn't like pyrogenics and dancing girls. I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know how to do that. Um, and I'm still not quite sure whether I like that. I like, I like people and being in a room with people. And that, that, going on that course really changed the trajectory of my career because by the time I went back to the UK, they were all foiling, and I said, you know, hashtag foils are dead. And that market disliked me intensely because I was so <laughs> Americanized, and I was painting hair, and I was talking about commerciality and all that wonderful stuff that I'd learned here. And I stuck to my guns on it, and there was plenty of room at the table because the consumer wanted that conversation. Other hairdressers might not have wanted it, but that was fear-based. Whereas I came in and went, you know, hats off, this is what we're doing, and I stuck to it. And it just changed. That's when the bright lights started that's when my you know star started rising and um you always think to yourself how long is this going to last for were you going there to to teach or were you going there to visit family were you going there so I mean we made the move to go back full time to england and um it was an adventure and a half it really was and it was as much as moving to america was career changing for me in the sense of i understood i learned was shown how to make money and to be successful behind the chair. Going back to the UK, I was able to, the next dimension was of course to show people how to do that too. And to be, be your authentic self and be unashamed and unabashed about being commercial. And that really wasn't a UK conversation and nobody was painting hair. So every single press, I could get, I got press all the time. And I was able to speak in a language that the consumer understood. So I wasn't technical. I'm not the most technical colorist. I'm quite a, feely sort of colorist so it's been interesting mm, that's really cool man i feel very very fortunate to have had such great opportunities and to have risked in it too yeah. and again the risks of course that we had a bit of money behind us and my my husband was working mm -hmm. so i could therefore not earn in a moment i mean my first english paycheck after america was 89 pounds for the month because i did f press and just freebies Sure. to get the word out there you know so there was but that was a, that was that was trading the short term for the long term yes yeah but there was privilege in it as yeah. well yeah, for yeah. sure yeah for sure that's crazy mm. did you um do you know reg laws no you know not that i know of he's a british i mean we, we pr partners yes yeah yes. that's that would that's where we came up we came through we came through his whole his, ah. his system and um british hairdresser you know no, i do know him because yes i met him somewhere yes i do of course i do uh, I am pretty hopeless, guys. So <laughs> I don't even know your names. I don't even know who I'm talking to. So don't worry. I live my life like this. I'm just like, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you go f here. You learn all the hustle culture. Mm. You go back. You're teaching uh, how to paint hair and stuff. Yeah. Then you decide to come back? No. So how it... W <laughs> no. Not as simple as that. So my husband was American. Um, and he liked it. He liked sticky, sticky toffee pudding and a few things like that, but he didn't really <laughs> like English culture much. Um, he liked, he liked a, dr a TV drama, but that was about it. Um, but he was very patient with me. And um, I went back to the UK and no product company wanted to work with me because I was too American. 
Um, and we don't do that. So I think L'Oreal UK, as much as I love you, they said to me at the time, we don't paint hair, even though it's the French technique. Right. We foil. And I sort of giggled. So I went and worked in warehouses. I started working with um, Matrix and because they were sold out of distributors, warehouses. So I did classes there for like nothing. But people came to them. You know, people came to them. And um, so I d was doing all of that. And then uh, I started working for a big brand that was an international brand at the time as their colorist, their primary colorist. And again, there was a l that was a real slog. I mean, when I look back on it, I'm like, well, how did you do that? And I can resent it in a moment, but I can also be really excited about it because those long nights and those collaborations taught me so much. Um, and I had a lot of it girls, like Poppy Delavine was a client at that point in 2013. Nobody was doing those it girls. And it, they all had that commercial hair that everyone loved, you know, and so, you know, pictures on the front page of Hello Magazine and stuff like that inside of Vogue just great things and the product companies then started seeing and I started working with a brand with L'Oreal Professional UK and then they offered me in an international role which I was like oh my goodness an international role what's this I mean I've, yes I've worked in the USA yes I've worked in the UK but internationally traveling was a whole new ball game to me but after a little bit I felt I wanted something else and I got offered I got offered a global role with Schwarzkopf it was a smaller company uh, but it was a bigger role, and so it was sort of a the sort of a side was upwards, and um, it caused a a bit of a ruckus. But it was a great experience for me, and um, did some great campaigns, and still working in the salon because I've always felt like what I always brought to the table that a lot of artists at that point didn't was that I worked behind the chair, I looked after women, I I heard the issues, I kept my my finger on the pulse of what was happening. Um, which is important uh, as a colorist, as a hairdresser. You, if you go behind a, into a, a boxed room without any windows and don't see anything, I think you can lose track of what's going on. And, um, and then the pandemic came. And the pandemic was, what do you do with that? And I, I'd been very successful as an analog hairdresser. Um, and then the pandemic came and there, was, there were no worldwide trips. There was no global role. There, there's nothing. In, there were no clients. Mm -hmm. You know, you're at home. And a, a very good friend of mine said to me, you need to get live on Instagram. I'm like, what? <laughs> Insta what? what? Insta what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I had a little bit on there, but nothing really great. And uh, I didn't know how to light anything because I'd had people lit me, you know? I mean, when you do these big brand things, there's a whole team of people making you look spectacular. Um, and I'm always thankful to those people because, you know, without them, you don't look great. And I, I need to them to follow me around because I never look great. <laughs> well, I wish I had that. I wish I had that too. But I learned how to light myself. And so I started off with a ring light and then I ended up with box lights. And you, you figure out, and I went live one, twice a week all the way through the pandemic. Just I found some doll heads in the spare room. I had some products. I just did what I did in a classroom, but I did it online. And, you know, we had three, 4,000 people a week tuning in to that wow. and commenting. And it wasn't brand specific product was always there because that's what I was using but people were fe feeling free to say oh I use this product if you use it this is how I do it and this is what you're saying and this community of you know we were decimated in lockdown our industry right I mean we're just treated so appallingly and um, but the built a community that got me through it too but in that time with Dwayne going between two countries and sort of worried really concerned about you know, we're only one government official from locking us into our country and maybe not being able to be with each other. And he's like, no, I want to go back. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And then, so we did it. And uh, just as we're coming out of the pandemic, we made the move back. Wow. That was a very long way to get around it, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> See, I mean, you don't, even need to you don't even need to interview me, right? Just like, let him chat away. Let's give him a question and go have dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Come back and he's still talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! How did you uh, when you were when you when you were talking about like doing you know once a week for like like an hour or twice so twice a week yeah. twice a week for how did you have enough content? Um, because I had enough doll heads, so <laughs> you know, so we. But even enough like like to teach. You said you were teaching just what you taught in the salon, like. Yeah, so I taught I taught from my house and I taught how to paint hair. So was it basically the same class each time that you taught it, or? Well, I'd hope to think it wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't on but repeat. But what I'm like for a couple of years, like, I mean, that's a lot of no, classes. It was, it was nine months. It was yeah, nine months while we were right, in lockdown. Fair. And so we did, I, so I, 
it started off with long hair, right? Because everyone paints long hair. And I realized pretty quickly that nobody paints shorter hair or medium length hair or bobs. And so I started doing commercial haircuts that you might find in the middle of any city on a woman of, say, 40 or 50. They might have turned that bob into a shorter in the back or something. And, you know, sort of standard stuff or fringes. And I would spend time talking about how you would do that. And then, you know, problem solving and answering questions. And then I had some people pop on and sort of talk to them. But there was, there was always something to offer. I mean, there's, you know, a huge amount of experience. And lots of people said, oh, you shouldn't be doing that because it's free. And I'm like, why not? The online is very different to in person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think it helped people. And it helped me, most importantly. It helped me get through yeah. a very difficult time. A lot of people needed that at that time. Mm. You know, yeah. especially in our community. Like you said, we were, we were decimated. Yes. Yeah, it was, and I think that we've, we've struggled yeah. since in many ways. You know, we're, we're people people anyway. Yeah. 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 It is, I mean, I, actually, I mean, it, I, I'm backing up because I don't want to get into it. But um, Let's not get into it, as yeah. they say on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. But what happened for me was I had like 40-something thousand followers, and I ended up with 230-something thousand, um, and just great interaction, and people felt that they could... You know, there was no, there's no trolling going on. It was just, it was people, it was people in our industry asking questions, helping each other out. It was, it was. I'm very proud of that. Pr probably the proudest thing I am in my career, really, because it was, I didn't get paid for it. I gave it freely. It helped people. It helped me. I mean, it, like in a very difficult time. Being consistent. You know, you said twice a week, every week. Mm -hmm. Being consistent that helps too. I mean, it, yeah. especially going from 40 to to 250, but. And that's not the reason why you were doing it, but that's the benefit of... of well, I could plan my week, right? Besides ironing the sheets, which gets very boring, right? <laughs> you know, and sort of walking the dog in the 15 minutes you were allowed to by government officials and how many cakes <laughs> can you make? And, you know, you couldn't go out. It was also planned the week. I could say, okay, so at one o'clock on a Tuesday and one o'clock on a Thursday, I'm going to go live for an hour. Two hours before that, you're doing lighting checks and making sure the doll head's right. And, you know, and the day went me as well so filling it was the time filled the time in a positive way and to be like i say to be successfully in an analog world and then to do that digitally at my age group that's something that isn't that necessarily that common yeah mm. w were you scared of that like that you wouldn't that, that, that you couldn't understand it or that you weren't going to understand it or understand just, so what? just that with the with the age gap and like how 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 do you communicate with you know a 20 year old hairdresser uh -huh. in this format i no, I wasn't scared of it at all. I was, I had no expectation of it, that, that, that which helps. was great. I mean, I didn't expect for it to blow up like it did. I mm -hmm. thought maybe, you know, five people might watch or something. Um, and age group wise, I've never had a problem hanging out with younger people or older people. I don't say this is the way you should, this is what you should do. I've always taught this is how I do it. And I think there's a big difference in that. And this is what's worked for me. And mm -hmm. just because I did this when I was younger, I don't expect you to do that now to have a great career. This is just my experience. Wow, it's really good. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. and and doing it for the right reason, and not doing it trying to to for the likes or to help yourself or to help. You know what I mean? Trying to make something up. Uh, so the likes are like a drug, <laughs> because when you, I mean, you know, four four point something million views on one of them. Uh, you know, it's like when Reels hadn't even started, it only really just started. I mean, the millions of views and likes, it's a drug. And it's like, how do you get more of it? And it starts kicking in. And the only way that that's, I, that stopped for me was when my husband died last year and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do Instagram. I couldn't, I didn't want to do that. And I stopped and you, you know, the figures have dropped. But also, I'm, I don't feel addicted to it at the moment either. So it's sort of like it's changed. My world's changed again. Wow. You, you brought it up. It, how did you, your, your husband pass? Well, I don't really want to talk about how he died, but it was sudden. Um, but I think that w for me, it was interesting because I had a lot of international jobs on and I just I stopped and everyone was like, work through it. And I'm like, I cannot work through this we, you know we've been together 22 years I, c I can't work through it I can't manage other people asking me about my grief um, and we live in we work in an industry that's very sort of people based and everybody wants to kind of like what happened how are you they want some people want to cry with you I didn't want to manage other people in it I needed to look after myself uh, so I took four months out 
um, and you know went through all sorts of things, and then slowly eased my way back into some trade jobs. And everybody at all the events was just so brilliant with me. I mean, talk about community holding you. You know, they'd let me do something, and I'd disappear and have a cry or like an emotional breakdown. And I'd come back, and they'd hold me up on stage and. Not literally hold me up, but do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could sort of turn it on for the camera for a minute. And um, I mean, I was just amazed at, I think that, you know, what you put out in the world, you get back. And I think all that other stuff, the outpouring of people's support was just absolutely, this industry is amazing, amazing. And um, my European jobs were like, don't worry, you've always turned up. So this isn't like a character defect. This is just a moment in time for you. Yeah. And this year I've been able to do, do more and get back into it and have my moments, but it's not as wobbly. Mm -hmm. But I'm coming up to the year and the year mark and the year marks are difficult. Mm -hmm. But I've also used the platform to talk about grief and I've talked about how I feel in it. And again, that's I think a little bit more American than English, um, but lots of messages from people talking about what they're going through. And we forget that, do we forget or did I forget that we're humans? doing hair, we're not machines, and we bring to the table all our stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, everyone that says leave it at home, try leaving it at home. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, I think, I think, I think that there's a, there's a difference in leaving it at home or leaving, or when we were kids, leave it at the door, right? Mm -hmm. Like leave it at the door, leave it at the door. You know, when it's real stuff, there's that. But, but I think like the daily stuff or the daily drama that's in your life, leave that at the door. Yes. You know, but, 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 but give, Give the space to the person that needs needs the hug or needs the love. Mm. No, bring that. We want that. You know, we just don't want that other stuff. We got to make space for that. Yeah. You know? So, and and even like 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 your European partners talked about. Like you've always showed up, Jack. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is your time. Take this time. You know, to me, it's kind of the same thing. It's okay to bring that into the salon because you know you, you probably need that. But you know, as far as like your daily drama or your drive to work or something. Leave that at the <laughs> leave that at the door. Well, you know, I think yeah. I think it's a different thing. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes I wish I could just leave myself at home and go to work, but of course we sure. can't. We it's, can't. It's not the nature of the, our game. Our yeah. game is that we need to be fully present or as present as possible to do the best that we can do on that day, and um, and that's what I try and do every morning when I get up. I remember when everything went down and um, just watching the outpouring to towards you, and, and and I was like, I. There's moments in this. There's moments in this industry where it's very frustrating, but there's also moments in this industry where you're very proud of this industry, mm. and, and that was one yeah. of those moments. Just to watch like the outpouring of support that, that that we saw, certainly digitally. Super grateful. I am super grateful for it all. And it, you know, I was. I mean, I don't want to turn this into a death podcast. <laughs> no, you know? we'll move on. But I was definitely one of those people that thought, you know, death, grief. Okay, you've had your time now. Get on with it. And it's not like that at it all. Work that way. And it's not it, a switch. No, it's not a switch. And it's been fascinating to me how it's sort of changed how I even see the industry and see the day to day. And it's sort of death does definitely change you. Um, and again, you don't know until it happens to you, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, but I, it's like definitely, I don't think that he would want me to be sat at home like weeping or throwing myself against the wall or drinking or whatever. I think that I think that he would be proud of the way, I'm certainly proud of the way that I've said, okay, I'm gonna walk through this fire and do the best I can with it on any given day. And if I lose the plot, I'm gonna apologize straight away and I'm not gonna use it as an excuse. I'm gonna pull myself back in and lose it at home, not lose it on someone else. So. That, that, that's very, uh, I think the word's evolved. Yeah. Right. I mean, kids, don't you think about, I mean, I'm in my mid fifties, you're in your mid fifties, Tony's in your mid fifties. And just like, it, it's amazing. If I think back about how I would have responded to whatever life throws yes. at you at 20 and how I, well, here's the difference at 20, I would have reacted. And mm -hmm. now I respond. Now I take the moment and I, I give myself the, the beat to respond instead of reacting. Yeah. The pause before you react. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. if I feel a reaction, like I know too, that, this is the body reacting to the situation. This isn't an excuse to lose my shit. Yeah. It's, we all have to learn when we learn, you mm -hmm. know? So it's interesting. That's really great. So uh, I'm, I'm really interested to talk about um, Social Art House. Mm. Like, I think what, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, obviously, but, but I just think what they're doing for the artist is, is fascinating. I, I, I think that, that, that 
what social art and this is the way that I understand it. So if there's something that I don't understand, if I'm understanding it wrong, mm. please correct me. But they're almost like an agent for hairdressers. Yes. You know, it, it's almost like 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 certainly with social media, like all these like quote unquote stars came out from nowhere. And I think <clears throat> my perspective is that the brands took advantage of, of that, but 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 because they had to. Like they were losing, they were losing the narrative, and how do they manipulate? Not manipulate. That sounds wrong because I think that they, I think that they were just trying to figure it out. But how do you figure out controlling the narrative by giving space for 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 different artists? And now we have now we kind of have a, a middleman, so to speak. Oh gosh, there's so much in that. Should we unpack it? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> let's get into it. We're not scared. Oh, of we're it. not on TikTok. Yeah. But let's get into <laughs> it. So I think that these people didn't come out of nowhere. These people were. They were already here. Just Fair. social media gave them an opportunity to be exposed when lots of people maybe at the table or wouldn't let people in, or there was a situation where you know somebody is that you didn't have to be in a big city to suddenly find success. Um, I love the fact that our social media stars were commercial hairdressers, so it's a plus for me, right? Mm -hmm. There was no avant-garde in that. It was like how tips and tricks that I use at home. Uh, in my salon to make me successful. That's a great this is how point, I by the create the, get these results. I think brands at one point, certainly in the USA and the UK, uh, they're the markets I can really speak to, were behind the artistry, and they had you know in the UK very much it was like the big the the big spenders got to be on stage. That was the plus, but the big spenders didn't always speak to necessarily other salons or didn't showcase what they really did commercially. And suddenly mm -hmm. all these influencers, and I put that in, you know, quote, can you see me? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's like that, I'm doing look, this. Look look real closer to here, I, do the quote. <laughs> yeah, quote. Um, and these influencers are talking about commercial tricks, and they were using product, and they were far more reach. You know, far more people were communicating with them, and I just think it was an ideal opportunity for our industry, which is always usually at the forefront of change in beauty, was able to pivot not necessarily smoothly. There were lots of people uncomfortable and angry about sure. it, but it's done it and we've moved. We've moved forward and you know, social media has done that. And we see, what we've seen is influencers who are great on camera and we've seen educators who are great on stage and we've seen product companies try and get them to work together uh, to, so that the benefit for the product company is that you've got an influencer who's going to be trained by a traditional educator mm -hmm. and a traditional educator who's going to be trained by an influencer. And so therefore, it's a win-win for everybody, right? Uh, some people have liked that. Some people have not liked that. People have been dismissive, but other people have embraced it. And it certainly worked for me. Sure. Uh, it certainly worked for me. So I think that the, re the money is to be made in selling products. We are salespeople, we're in the service industry, we're serve public servants in many ways. So cr and don't be offended and don't come at me for saying that if you don't, if you don't follow it. <laughs> but I think that the idea is that we, I'm selling a look, I'm selling a dream, I'm selling an, uh, a perception, I'm selling an ideal of how I see color, I'm selling a taste level. These are the products I use to get it. People want to do it maybe like me. And so they buy the product in thinking that if they do it like that and they use the product, then they're going to be nearer that goal. And that's just normal ways in which you sell. It's the ways in which we live. Mm -hmm. You know, why I buy something from a store or have a certain car, it makes me feel a certain way. So I just think it's a, a new dynamic. Um, and I think it's, I love that about our industry that we, we are continually having to evolve and adapt and change. And it's important that we do. And it's important that those at the top are open armed to those that are coming up the ranks and you know we should be inclusive i love i love that you know w when w you know back in like the 90s and stuff when we were coming up it was the you would go to by the way i'm not throwing any shade this is just the way the business was throw a bit <laughs> throw a bit <laughs> but you know you would go you would go to an Wella event and it would always be the doves on stage representing wella right there was like there yep. was nobody else every every year it, w it was them and they did great collections and they did great stuff um, or you'd go to Redkin and it would be Sam and, and a couple other uh, people that were representing representing the brands. And you brought up a good point too that you talked about the art the artistry was coming out of the brands. Well, usually it was one or two people coming up with that artistry. So then I quite then I, I put into the question: Is that artistry? Because shouldn't, isn't the artistry from a, as much collaboration within the industry that we could possibly have? And I think social media has opened that up. Like what, how we see artistry now is completely different than how we saw artistry in two thousand twelve. Well, I think we're going to have another change anyway, because let's talk I about think, it. let's talk about it. <laughs> I think that when I go on Instagram, everything looks the same again. 
it all looks the same. You know, we had all those ashy blondes at one point. We have this lived in color that's been going on for forever. To live like, too long. Live too long. <laughs> uh, you know, so we've got a, we've got a generation of hairdressers that don't know how to foil to the root, don't know how to paint hair to the root. You know, for whatever reason that they're lived in specialists. Well, what happens when that disappears? And I think it's about to disappear. And I think that we're going to have another change. And if everything's the same, it feels like I'm walking through some sort of suburban nightmare. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, so let, where's the difference? And I think that our industry loves a nuance. We like, you know, people pick something up and then somebody sees it and they play with it and it changes and it adapts and that it's just so much fun. And I think we're ready for another change. I, I agree. Do you see? Do you see where the change is? No. I, if I did, I'd be on it. I know you would. Yeah, definitely. I'd be riding that, riding that one. But no, I, I don't know. I think that for me, I think that. You know, if I see another head set of hands behind a head of hair, I might just kill myself. Not literally, but it's like, okay, it's done. And if it's working for you, great. But it's like, can we have something else? If we have that sort of chin down pose with the hair at the side, I don't want to see another beach wave. I want to see something else. And we are seeing changes, but they're maybe not happening as quickly as I necessarily want or necessarily want to see, but we are. It's just, I need to pay more attention probably. But, the, but we set social media up for that right so you have influencers uh that set the stage of you know this is what i'm doing and and the the biggest flattering thing someone can do is copy, copy right absolutely so now you have all these influencers up here created all these things and then you have a whole industry that copying and recreate yep. it now like you said now it's all the same right yes. so i i th to figure out what that change is going to be is going to be massive Yes, and it's also going to be a winner for somebody, yeah. yeah. Right, and then we'll all we'll all ride that one yeah. and enjoy it too. And it, but it, and that's the fun yeah. thing, as long as you, as long as you're okay with not being the star in a moment, right? And that somebody else can be that star, and that you can still shine bright, but you might not shine as bright as you did at one moment. As long as you're okay with that, then it's great. Well, we heard a great quote this morning. I think it fits. It's like nobody wants to be first, and nobody wants to be second. <laughs> <laughs> I usually come in about third or fourth, you know, or, or I, you know, I'm the boy that gets the F at school or something, or just doesn't turn up for the exam because they never think they're going to do it. So yeah, come on, all you people with Fs, follow me. I mean, you would think the natural progression of it would be that we would start seeing shorter looks. You know, we, we've seen we've seen the past shoulder length. We've seen we've seen the well. I guess it's kind of has. I mean, then we got to like the the chin length, like beach waves and stuff like that. Are, are we going back into like strong pixies? So are you talking cutting here? Well, just imagery. Imagery. I don't know. It has to be something that sort of like challenges. As long you as perms way. don't come back, I'm golden. You know, I am the boy that used to perm and oh, then I know. do cap highlights. <laughs> oh, it's cap highlights first and then perm afterwards. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that yeah. was, that and then was it, it was on the floor. <laughs> no, it was all fine. It was dried with a metal round brush and they all went home <laughs> they and they loved it, it. It was fine. Oh, my God. Do you remember the Solano like metal nozzles? Yes. I laid one on a client's forehead Burned once. Them. Oh, my gosh. It was the worst oh. day of my life. Oh. I've she, done many a thing that's gone terribly wrong. She has permanent Botox, which is good, but it's kind of pulled <laughs> really tight. Gosh. Oh. What, what, what are some of your salon nightmares? Nightmares or my own personal bad, terrible experiences? Like, like where, like the mistakes you've made or like, oh. like mine, like, like, you know, burning someone's forehead into Botox. So years ago, before I did my color degree or anything like that, I mean, I was very, very young and it used to be record cards and you pull out the filing cabinet, and I read this woman's formula, and it's, it said it was a tube of a high lift tint with 40 volume in those days, and it said half a tube of blue concentrate, and it didn't feel right to me, so I went to the senior technician, and I, she said, yeah, 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 that's on the card. I'm like, you sure? She said, yeah. So then I went to somebody else, and I asked them, and I was like, are you sure? And they're like, yeah, 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 it's on it. So I applied it. Well, as soon as I applied it, right, you can imagine it's going in electric blue on a blonde, and I'm like, I went downstairs again and I said, hey, you know, this doesn't look right to me. I'm really, really worried. And they came up and they're like, no, it's going to be fine once you rinse it. And I rinsed it. And of course it wasn't. It was electric blue. And I got into trouble for it. And I'm like, how do I get into trouble for this? When I've asked all these people, I wasn't over cocky. I, I thought about it. And obviously it was half an inch, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't the brightest bulb in the tanning booth or any of that, you know. And so, of course, it had to be bleached out and everything. And the lady was fine at the end of it, but it was absolutely traumatic for me. Um, and I didn't feel supported in it at all. And I would hate that to happen to somebody else because it was just really unfair. Everyone was too busy and didn't listen to the question, you know. What else have I done? 
That's my worst one. And I'm a hair colorist as well. Can you imagine having that as part of your story? Uh, no, well, that the, you know, I, I think the the best the best operators are the ones that have made the the biggest mistakes. Because yeah. they probably they probably enter you probably enter in a lot more cautious because of that than you did you know just. I never slap bottom. anything on, and I like to measure it and all those <laughs> things, you know. So you I mean you see all sorts of things. What else have I done? I was really hung over. I did one just day. a year and a half ago. And I'm I'm so religious about triple checking the tube, you know, pull it out of the box, uh, read the tube, read the tube, read the tube. And just last Christmas, not 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 a couple months ago, but a year and a half ago, I, I didn't do it, and it ended up being like a six R, on, on like a, on like a level eight, you know. And it was it was in the right box, but it was it wasn't the right tube. Yes, nice, you know? nice, nice person to put that back. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Oh my God! I had to cancel. It was the Saturday before Christmas. I had to cancel the whole day because now it was. It became a full day correction. Uh huh. You know? uh-huh. But they loved you. <laughs> she does actually. Oh, lucky you. Was it and your uh, wife? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Divorce papers. No, she's actually <laughs> British. Oh. Yeah. Oh, the Brits are so easy, as we know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. What does seem the nightmare? Um. Well, I had a nightmare that I that I was so hung over and I called up and said, I'm not coming in today a long time ago and said, you better get in and start shouting and swearing at me. And I'm like, if you fire me at the end of the day, I'm not coming in now. And he's just get in. So I did that. So that was the only time that I never turned up. Um, and then I've had difficult women that I've tried to please. And you know, when your gut starts going and you start and sweat starts below your lip, and it sort of runs down your chest and down your trousers and you know, you shouldn't do it and you do it. Mm. Um, so difficult women, I think, who have unrealistic expectations of what their hair can do, and that I've said yes. Mm. And I think mm. one of the great things about being older um, is that I've learned to say no, and not no out of fear. I always worry that we say no, no we don't. No. no out of no, because know that it's not going to work, I'm not going to make you happy. And I'll happily say, I'm not the colorist for you. And, uh, and people don't like that. Um, so I found in the last decade that I've been much stronger in that. It's, imagine being 40 something mm. and still saying yes. Um, I'm slow, <laughs> very slow. <laughs> um, and also that whole kind of valuing what I do, you know, it's like that I, I talk in my education about, you know, we put too many things in the hair, we don't need to do that. The contrast is our best friend, depth is our friend and everything. And I can sometimes see myself putting an extra one in or they're like, oh, can I have a few pieces down? I'm like, oh yeah, there's no charge for it. I'm like, why are you doing that? You do you know what I mean? I've got bills to pay myself. And I'm like, oh, those kind of things are, are the, the real nightmares for me. The disasters, yes, I've cut somebody's hair too short or sure. the color was off or there was hot roots today because I didn't know what a hot root was. Or I thought, you know, 20 volume says it will cover gray hair when actually 12.5 would have been fine or 10. And, right. you know, all those things that you kind of figure out who the, the colorist that you are. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the people skills, it's taken me a long time to learn them and a long time to be kinder to myself in it too. Um, and it's like the last thing you want is a, a red flag client that breaks you, but a red flag isn't to say no straight off. And I think that's what people do. Red flags are warnings yeah. and you look at the warning and whether or not you're strong enough to take it on or not is different. But there's also the other thing. And of course is the fact that if you need the money, you're gonna have to do it, you know. Mm. Maybe. 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 <laughs> you know, I, it, it was. It it's was not easy out there, right? It's yeah. expensive. I mean, have you, anyone's been to the grocery mark, grocery store? It's expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, and everyone's complaining about us putting our prices up, um, but yet yeah, all our bills are going up too. So it's like, you know, we live in the same world. Yes. You know, we live in the same world as everyone else. Um, it's funny, like when I was in my twenty and thirties, like. You talk about the clients that you're like, you're kind of like on the fence or they're mm. red, they're, they're red flag clients. And like my ego would say I could fix it, which then ended yes. up like, you know, like three days later, like, like, oh my gosh, why did I do that? You know, now, now I'm still dealing with it. Well, that phone call, I'm not happy. And you're like, oh, but you probably. I'm glad we're in the same city because when I get that call, I'm going to say, go see Jack Howard. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm out of town. <laughs> but you know, I'm not happy or it's not bright enough or, you know, the biggest problem I face at the moment in America, I think, is that women that have their highlights done every four, five, six weeks. And it's like, you know, there's that regrowth line on there from a highlight, there's too many highlights, and you're saying, hey, hold on, slow it down. We'll do this and come back in eight weeks and let's have some depth in there. And the, there's, the people have got the money to pay for it and they want it, and it's like they've got to work through that difficult period of not having it and holding that person's hand. Um, that's more difficult in England, it's more difficult to get them to come back 
right to spend the money so it's the opposite and so it's so fascinating to me that we seem so similar yet we're so different so different so funny he just he's going to do consultations so how did how did you hear about us oh Corey gray (laughs) 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 well he said he doesn't know our names we're gonna gonna, gonna have to reschedule i'm remembering (laughs) that name now right (laughs) (laughs) write that down jack here's, here's a great hairdresser story i'm about to throw tony under the bus he had a client go, have you ever cut anyone? Tony said, nope, and then nipped off the top of his ear. Oh, and classic. As I'm saying no, boom. She has slid in. Yes. Because <laughs> like, I was doing scissor over comb, right? And he goes, have you ever? I was like, no. Bam. I was like, ah, now you're my first. Thanks for jinx- <laughs> jinxing me. Jinx. Uh, and boy, do those things bleed. Yeah, they do, right? They yeah. do slap a tissue on that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a literally, of, it was like a, a bit of towels. liquid peroxide. <laughs> 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 Jack, what's your what what uh, what's your advice to your younger self? Oh, I don't know whether I like that question. Can we start again? <laughs> Jack, what would be your advice to an up and coming hairstylist? Uh, I would say that first of all, you should before you you decide to niche. Everyone talks about niching, right? That's a mm. social media thing. Make sure that you can do everything, right? So that you can do a finger wave, so that you can do a pin curl, so you can ri- wind a perm on base or a roller on base not just use a curling iron, so that you can cut properly, so that you can color all types of hair, so you can go to the root, away from the root, so you can play with all different colors and learn how to formulate. Then you can niche when you find out what you truly love versus what you're frightened of. That would be my biggest advice. I wish uh, we listened to that. I I sure do. That's actually, um, I'm a colorist as well, and um, one of my I don't, want, I don't want to use the word regret, but one of the things that I wish I had done was had a better understanding of, of, of cutting hair. Mm. Um, and even now, like, I'm fascinated by extension work and stuff, but I'm so terrified of scissors that I don't even know how I would do it. So I'm really good at telling people how to do a blow dry and absolutely rubbish at actually doing it Your myself. <laughs> yeah, they hate me. For when I'm like, I need a blow dry that does all these things. And then I'm like, but I can't blow dry. Okay. And I'm like, mm, not quite right. So, yeah, I wish I could actually blow dry properly. Like with a proper bristle I brush. A, I think that I think that's a, a, a and we. I don't know if I'm going to throw them under the bus. I'll throw them under the bus. Um, we grew up in a British based salon, you know, with Reg Laws, and and um, when he first entered the industry, um, uh, Philip Wolf worked with us before oh, yes. he moved to L.A. Right, and and he said on the on the podcast, he said that you know I had a real understanding of structure and how haircuts worked, having like this British background, but I didn't understand how hair blew out until he worked for Privé in LA mm-hmm. and it's just like this French like understanding of, of, of how a blowout works and, and between those two is, is, is the Philip Wolf that we get today. I love a good blow dry. I really do. When you see somebody, when you see someone and they're All the gay boys say that. For heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> very de- I thought you two were gay. No, no we're not. <laughs> you're an otter and you're no. a bear, right? No. <laughs> the, the bear. The, uh, the, yeah. what, what do you call me? Otter. Uh, otter. Yeah. otter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which otter. is different than a weasel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might call you that afterwards. I love <laughs> a great blow dry. When, when you see somebody blow drying the hair and the hair just starts moving and they've the lovely wave to it and it's just so elegant and so fresh and airy. I just... Yeah. It's amazing because you can't do that with a curling tongue. You know, it's it's a brush and a dryer, and it, it's incredible. You see some of the guys who are used to working with curly hair, and they blow that hair out, and it's just like, wow, that's a skill. Yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah. That's a skill, right? For, I mean, for a short a, career, it's a skill. It'd be a big, big fuzzy mess with me. I would be like, throw the dryer on the floor. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's uh, do you think I'm accurate, though? Do you think it is a British thing as, as not not – not mastering the, the finish. So I think what, you, what you're what you speaking to is a specific part of the British industry that was all about cutting. Um, but, you know, when I <laughs> we'll went... we bring Vidal Sassoon back up. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> but when I went to work in Mayfair, it was all big blow dries, brushes, roller sets on it. I hadn't seen anything like that in a long time. But, of course, that was all those bouncy blow dries. And they're still doing them now, right? Because the, everybody seems to love a bouncy blow dry. So... I think part of British culture was British hairdressing culture was about the cut, the artistry of the cut. Mm-hmm. But I think there was another part of it that loves the blow dry. But the, um, of course, in America, it was the blow dry, right? You know, you start off with Farrah Fawcett, and that's yeah. that fantastic yeah. '70s blow dry, and it's just gone on ever since. You know, the irony of this of this conversation that we're having now is Trevor. When we interviewed Trevor Sorby, 
he was talking about the influence of Vidal Sassoon. And, and, and his quote was, if you've ever held a blow dryer, we we're talking about how his influence with Vidal Sassoon is, is bigger than the hair industry. Because if you've ever held a blow dryer in your hand, that's, that's the inspiration of Vidal Sassoon. So I, I just found that fascinating. I'm not really that interested in the haircut, to be honest. I'm interested in the finish and the color, uh, the, all the precision with short fringes that look strange on people and asymmetric cuts and everything. I get the fact that it's the artistry. I don't like it. I don't see it as commercial. I don't see it as particularly viable. So, you know, hate me for that, but that's how I feel about it. Well, I mean, there's a place for it, right? I mean, there's a place for everything. Yeah. Like, there's room at the table for everyone, but it's just not my kind of thing. I love, I like glossy, glossy hair. Yeah. Can't create it because you get the frizz ball, but you know, you like the glossy hair. Well, that's why I need a great hairdresser by my side, <laughs> right? Go. As a colorist, right. I can't do it on my own because it all looks right. a disaster. So I need, so I need teamwork, collaboration, all the things I talked about to begin with. Say by yes the way, the I agree. Agree. say yes to the dress. I, I totally agree. You know, uh, I, I, I don't know too many colors that are great. You know, finisher. Monty? Why do you keep asking me if I know all these people? Because they're, they're our friends and Who's they're in Monty? DC. They're all in DC. I know. I don't know. Who's Monty? Who's DC? Monty Durham. It's in DC. DC. Oh, Washington, DC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No idea. No. Yeah. Oh, he you know was, anyone in DC? No, not really. Because <laughs> he's never there. He just pays taxes. That's <laughs> it. Like, <laughs> pays his taxes. I walk my do- I live on Capitol Hill. <laughs> I walk my dogs, you know, and it's like I, I drive to work, and that's it. That's awesome. Mm. Jack, thank you for uh, hanging out with this man. Actually, I've really enjoyed myself. I was trepidation coming upstairs. I was ter- you re- I was is that ter- real? Yeah, terrified. I'm terrified of my own shadow sometimes. But yeah, uh, really nice. We're the nicest guys ever. You very much are. You're going to take me to the bar next, right? That, that, well, no, yeah, apparently we're going to the lobby next because apparently the there's lobby. something going on there. I love a hairdressing party. <laughs> <laughs> Amateur night. <laughs> That's so if you love over. a hairdresser's party, then you've got to come to our show next year. Yes. now And it's local. It is not that local. <laughs> Fredericksburg <laughs> is Frederick, not. Frederick, not Fredericksburg. Frederick, Frederick. Frederick is not local to D.C. That's an hour, but my sister-in-law lives that way. Oh, she yeah. does? Yes. Is she, hair, is, no, she, 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 is she a hairstylist? She lives in Stafford, so I could actually drive out. No, we're the other way. Where are you then? We're in Maryland. Frederick, Maryland. Oh, I don't even know that. <laughs> right. See what happens? <laughs> right. Boys have got me confused. Right. It's a friendly neighborhood. You, you, you'll like it. Where's Maryland? Bat. Jesus. <laughs> I'm joking, everyone. I do know where the borders are. Right. So he, he clearly doesn't know the borders. You should see what he's wearing. <laughs> 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 You're terrible, Muriel. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, how can oh, people find you? Awesome. Uh, so it's Jack Howard Color, spelt the American way, C O L O R. What did you do that for? Because it annoyed the British. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> they did say you're too American. It, it was a better for search, right? It was better for SEO, color the American way, the way everyone, the whole world spells it except the British. So, <laughs> yeah. They, they just throw U's in everywhere. Yes, they throw very strange things in everywhere, don't they? But, you know, I am British. I'm proud of it, but I spell color because I want search. So it's Jack Howard Color, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook business, uh, my podcast, which I haven't done for a year, but I'll start doing that again. And uh, my education platform, which is free, is Jack Howard and Friends. Oh, I like that. Mm. It's like a Presley Poe and Friends. Yeah. Jack Howard and Friends. I like that. That's really good. Um, Jack, thanks again, man. Seriously, thank you for uh, making time for us and, and, and coming up and hanging out with us. And hopefully you leave with a bigger smile than you came in here with all that nervousness and stuff. I've actually enjoyed myself, so thank you very oh. much, both of you. Awesome. Well, thanks, all three Jack. of you, actually. All three of you, yeah. Shout out to Greg behind us there. Mr. Jack Howard, thank you very, very much for joining us on Your Day Off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating, and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hairdistry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.